In the name of the one who loves us, the one who saves us, and the one who spurs us ever on. Amen. Please be seated. When I was a kid, I hated spinach. Back in the day, we had none of those nice cellophane packages of fresh spinach. It came from a can and it was bitter tasting, and it looked like the lawn clippings that were left on the grass after my father had done his Saturday morning chores. And no matter how many times that I was told it was good for me, it would make me stronger, it seemed almost impossible to ingest and metabolize without at least two glasses of milk to wash it down. Well, Jesus' words in Luke's gospel are a little bit like that. They're a little hard to hear, a little hard to ingest. We know that they're good for us. But I think what Jesus is really doing as he continues this Sermon on the Plain, which we heard last week, with blessed are the poor and then the woes at the end. What he's doing is pointing to the distance between God's perspective and ours. Take the golden rule as an example. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Now this wasn't unique to Jesus. Many ancient philosophers also said this. Homer even quoted this. But what Jesus does is that he calls for a radical interpretation of this rule. Loving our enemies and doing good to those who hate or curse us or even physically harm us. He's telling us that our response to others is not predicated on their behavior and to make it even more unpalatable to our sense of fairness. And then add to that, Jesus tells us that God's gifts come as generously to the undeserving as they do to the deserving. Well, like the bitter spinach of my youth, that can be hard to swallow. And it cuts against the grain of our natural human response to perceived enemies or those who may curse what we value. So how do we move from our natural instinct to match blow for blow and word for word and instead live our lives responding with mercy and with kindness instead of reacting with words or actions that seek to answer hurt with more hurt? Well, friends, I think it begins by remembering how God responds to us, how much we are loved by God, how much God's unconditional love is bestowed on everyone, even those that we don't much care for. goodness, and we can be part of making the kingdom a whole lot different by reflecting as best we can God's mercy for us and others. You know, there's a story that's told by peace activist Hildegard Gossmeyer. She was born in Austria, and during World War II, the Russian army entered her village at the end of the war. And because the soldiers were victorious and they were very hungry, everyone expected them to come into the town to loot and to destroy, take the spoils of war. Yet when they pounded on her unlocked door, her father opened it and he welcomed them in like guests. And he invited his family to create an atmosphere of trust for the dreaded Russians. <laughs> 
And accordingly, the soldiers did not plunder or rape or do whatever else they could do. But seeing that the family was weak and thin, they shared their own meager supply of food. And while this particular story has a somewhat unexpected and happy ending, I find myself asking, why does it surprise me to hear the words of today's gospel translated into actuality? Well, I imagine it's because when Jesus asks us to listen to what he's really saying, particularly in regards to vengeance, it was and still is rare to see that lived out and to respond as Jesus directs. Just think about it. It's more likely for us to sympathize with the underdog or the underground forces who bomb occupying armies or the police who shoot a murderer, or the victim who secures his revenge. Bring to mind the last James Bond movie, where when the bad guy gets his due, we cheer and applaud heartily. Why is that? Well, I would venture that our understanding of mercy is quite puny in comparison to God's. And because too often we solely rely on ourselves and what we can accomplish on our own, we witness the impossibility of our world changing in any meaningful way. But whether we realize it or not, we cannot live the way that Jesus enjoins in our gospel today without God's help. We just can't. And maybe that's the starting point for all of us. Recognizing that we are totally dependent on God's grace to live as Jesus describes. And that if we listen, really listen to what Jesus is saying, I think his words in the gospel today can be more than just instruction but they can be heard as a promise that God sees more in us than we can see in ourselves, that God has a plan and purpose for us, and that God intends to use us to achieve something spectacular. And that something spectacular is precisely being who God created you to be. And if you can live into that, you can help create a different kind of world. And Jesus calls this new world the kingdom of God, where violence does not always breed more violence and hate doesn't always kindle more hate. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King captured the logic of Jesus' kingdom well when he stated, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So can we do this? Can we turn the other cheek? Can we love our enemies? Pray for those who persecute us? Be merciful as God is merciful? Well, no, not every day. And certainly not without the power and nutrition of God's grace. And on some days, it might taste bitter and not look all that pretty. But that's not really the point of God's grace. And it's not our job to bring in the kingdom. Jesus has already done that. But I think it is our job to practice living like Jesus' disciples and citizens and ambassadors of this new kingdom that is present, but not fully here yet. And this approach doesn't forget or even minimize the presence of sin in us or in the world. I know it's a hard thing to think about the sin in ourselves. 
but neither does it assume that God is limited by our sin. Rather, it takes seriously that we are always being called by Jesus to be more than we thought we could be and invited to claim our identity as God's chosen. And so Jesus' message here, returning hate with love, turning the other cheek, praying for those who stand against you, it's really countercultural. But it's lived reality. While some would like to say it will bring you riches or get you into political office, that isn't going to happen with this kind of living. But it may help change the world for the better. And because Jesus has promised to do the heavy lifting, we're free to take care of the corner of the world in which we live, practicing to live like Jesus' disciples throughout the week, and then returning here again to be reminded of God's grace and God's love, and most importantly, God's forgiveness, so that we can be sent out once again to live as part of Jesus' kingdom. St. Augustine, when he would celebrate the Eucharist, would invite people, and we say words similar to this at the Eucharist, I want you to listen for them today, receive who you are, and then go become what you have received. So we're invited each week to receive once again the identity that God has given each one of us to become beloved community. You know, a few years back, I was invited to a dinner party for folks who were federal employees in the town uh, where I was serving. They were there for training, and it was so close to Thanksgiving, they didn't have Friday off that they couldn't go home. <coughs> and so the owner of the hotel hosted a party, and she was one of the most I have ever met. Well, one of the guests was a young woman from Hawaii and she definitely was not prepared for winters or late fall in this part of the world. She was shivering throughout dinner. And as the party was ending and folks were getting their coats and saying goodbye, I watched another guest give the shivering young woman her coat. The warm, fleecy jacket fit her perfectly. And the guest told the young woman she should keep it. Well, there was some back and forth between the two of them. But eventually, the woman from Hawaii left with that warm jacket. Now, neither of these women had met before that evening. And later, after the dishes were done and most folks had gone back to the hotel or their homes, the guest who had given the woman the, young, the jacket quietly went to her car wrapped in a blanket. And while this act of kindness wasn't extraordinary, this kind of generosity, generosity that seeks nothing in return, is what I believe the great reward Jesus is speaking to in the last line of this morning's gospel. Not a reward of full wallets, garages or houses of self-esteem, but rather, our reward is who we become in the process of for this world. It's hard. It's really hard for those of us who listen and follow Jesus. But as we leave here today, I invite you to think about what coat can I give away? Where can I walk an extra mile? What enemies can I love? Consider God, who God has called you to be, and perhaps by praying for someone with whom you struggle, it might be the first of many steps in a journey of grace and freedom that will lead you to wholeness. And if you are like me, you just might begin to enjoy the spinach of God's grace, which contains no bitterness and doesn't look like lawn clippings. And its nutrients will help you grow. <laughs>
into the person that God has called you.